Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our uh, interactive panel um, with uh, Dr. Uh, Marcus Weldon, our distinguished guest, and uh, uh, leading colleagues from um, uh, the Purdue College of Engineering and College of Science. Um, I'm Dimitri Perolis, the head of EC, and it's my pleasure to uh, open this panel. Uh, this panel will be uh, organized and uh, monitored by uh, Professor Anand Ragunathan. Professor Agunathan is a colleague in ECE. He is the Silicon Valley professor in ECE. Um, he serves as the associate director of the SRC DARPA funded center on brain inspired computing. And he's also the co director of our newly launched um, Center for uh, Secured Microelectronics Ecosystem. Uh, professor Agunathan's interests are in the areas of brain inspired computing, uh, AI. Uh, computing with beyond CMOS devices and hardware enabled uh, security. Uh, he's a well recognized uh, person in the field. He's a fellow of IEEE. Uh, he has received uh, multiple awards, including nine best paper awards, um, Qualcomm, IBM faculty awards, and our very own Purdue College of Engineering Faculty Excellence Award. Uh, with that, my personal thanks uh, to Anand for uh, uh, doing this, and Anand, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, Dimitri. Can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Wonderful. And I will start uh, sharing my screen. Um, I'd appreciate it if you could confirm once more that you are able to see my screen as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll start by uh, thanking the panelists. Uh, we have a really eminent set of panelists here today. Uh, hopefully, we can have a fun discussion. Um, I also would like to acknowledge Professor Sumit Gupta, who um, will be joining us um, soon uh, for putting together this panel, you know, inviting the panelists and, and working with me to uh, think about the focus of the panel. Um, so uh, what we came up with was uh, the future of AI and quantum computing. Will they synergize? So um, I will uh, you know, present just a couple of slides that I put together to motivate the panel and kind of set the context and then introduce the panelists and turn it over to them. Uh, and uh, again, looking forward to the audience participation. Uh, some logistics, uh, uh, I'd appreciate it if everybody could keep themselves, uh, other than the panelists, could keep themselves muted uh, and ask your questions through the chat. Um, remember to chat it, uh, type out the questions either to me or to everyone so that I get to see them and I will read them out to the panelists. Um, okay, with that, let's get started. Uh, if you look at the um, top technologies for the next decade and beyond, and, and you know, admit there's many such lists you can find uh, out there, but most of them will have two common um, technologies that you will see, um, and, and they, those are AI and quantum, right? Um, here's just a couple of examples, and I uh, interestingly came up with this new acronym, the dark age. And I thought, okay, you know, that's interesting. We're going to go back to the dark age and D it's actually a um, acronym standing for, you know, D uh, for distributed ledgers like blockchain and so on a is AI, R is, you know, extended reality, augmented virtual extended reality. And Q of course, uh, the fourth horseman that is quantum computing. So um, we'll focus on the A and the Q, AI and quantum. Uh, again, the, these, you know, very few dispute that these are very, very promising technologies have already um, uh, started to make their mark. Uh, the question here in the panel, you know, uh, each of these is probably deserving of, you know, multiple panels on its own, but we are focusing on the intersection of these two areas, uh, these two technology trends. Will they form a virtuous cycle? You know, what will the relationship between, you know, AI and quantum computing and quantum information systems um, at, at large be? Uh, so this is uh, the topic that we will uh, try to debate. Uh, and discuss. Um, I've started with a few seed questions to the panelists uh, that will hopefully warm up the discussion, but uh, the most important bullet on the slide is the last one for the uh, intended for the audience. Your questions go here. So I do encourage uh, the audience to jump in and, and, and ask um, questions. I know that there's several um, faculty and students at Purdue who are you know, uh, experts in these two areas, so we look forward to an engaging discussion. Um, so the questions, I'll just quickly read them out and I'll return to the slide when the panelists actually uh, start addressing them. Uh, what are the top two challenges in AI and quantum computing? And feel free to pick two in each uh, that the next decade of research should aim to address. Uh, and then we will focus uh, you know, on, that, on that relationship between quantum and AI and the two facets of it, right? How can AI help drive progress in quantum computing and, and quantum technologies, um, and, and as well as how can quantum computing help drive progress in AI? 
Um, and then, you know, uh, we'll, we have a few other questions, but we, I'd really love to see questions coming from the audience uh, beyond that point. Okay, so with that, uh, I will uh, hand it over to the panelists and um, introduce each of them one by one and maybe have um, them give a, a brief, you know, three to four minute kind of opening uh, statement. And then we will go through, you know, each of those questions. So let me just stop sharing the screen here. We will um, start with uh, Marcus, our invited presenter, from whom we just heard a really wonderful talk um, on on um, innovation. Um, so uh, for those of you who uh, were not at the uh, at the seminar, um, Marcus uh, is responsible for. Uh, Dr. Weldon is responsible for coordinating the technical strategy across Nokia. Um, and uh, previously, uh, he served as president of Bell Labs, where he was responsible for defining and creating uh, next generation disruptive uh, innovations and uh, the research that will form the foundation of the future ICT industry. Um, what I found really remarkable about um, his background was that he holds a PhD in physical chemistry, but is you know, uh, uh, really insightful and, and knowledgeable about a wide, wide range of topics. Um, uh, uh, and uh, you know he's 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 won numerous technical scientific and engineering society awards for both his technical work but also his vision and leadership. Um, and I think we saw an excellent example just you know from the talk uh, he gave of, of his ability to distill you know very complex multidimensional problems spanning you know uh, the, the 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 business aspects you know commercial aspects and and technological aspects uh, in, into the essence um, of the right questions and maybe the solutions that need to be. Uh, pursued. Um, so why don't we start with uh, uh, Dr. Weldon, and um, if you could just give us your initial opening thoughts. My opening thoughts, uh, one is, uh, despite supporting a quantum computing effort at Bell Labs, I'm a quantum skeptic. Uh, but I am uh, an AI believer if I change AI to augmented intelligence, meaning, and, and that'll also explain my, my attitude on quantum computing. Fundamentally, I think AI needs to be coupled to human needs slash physical world problems uh, and not just do pattern recognition, which I think is sort of, uh, the, you know, the first phase of AI is, is simple pattern recognition, whether it's spoken word or image. I think, but our brains do much more than recognize patterns. We reason about those, those, uh, those two sensory inputs, you know, auditory or, or visual. And, and I think we have to, create a reasoning AI system. And the reason I'm skeptical on the quantum topic for this panel is I'm not sure a quantum system will help us reason at a humanistic level. It'll help us reason about quantum phenomena. I actually fully support that. But if I am a focused uh, or logically think the innovation of the next few decades is about teaching machines to think collaboratively and assisting humans, uh, I think the, spot, the part that is quantum theory related is a small part of that space. The part that is physical world macro phenomena that typically are not quantum phenomena uh, is a much larger space. So for the purposes of my opening statement, I will say, I think I'm a believer in verif well, I am a believer in the need for verifiable AI systems uh, that, that verifiable in, in a couple of ways that the answer is, has not been perverted or distorted. And secondly, that it represents a reasonable view of the of the physical world, uh, and I think quantum systems can't really help with that for the macro problems I'm interested in. So that's uh, my intro. Okay, Th thank you very much, and and that's great to have that view because uh, I think uh, you know uh, I hope that that will engender some healthy discussions. Uh, we'll move on to Jennifer uh, Neville. So Professor Neville is the Miller Family Chair Professor of Computer Science and Statistics at Purdue. Um, she is an elected member of the Triple AI Executive Council and, and uh, chaired prominent conferences uh, in, in, in the field of machine learning and data mining. Uh, she received the NSF Career Award, uh, was chosen by IEEE as one of AI's 10 to watch, um, and was also selected uh, as a member of the DARPA Computer Science um, Study Group. Um, so Professor Neville uh, is an expert in the area of machine learning and, and data mining. So if you could share your opening thoughts with us, please. Sure, thanks, Anand. 
Uh, so you can hear me okay? I made sure to unmute, yes. Uh, great. Um, yes, so I thought as Marcus started talking that he was starting to say the sentence I was going to say, which is that I'm not an expert in quantum. Um, and so, uh, you know, I work on machine learning and AI methods, um, particularly focusing on developing methods that will help um, do prediction and make decisions in complex networks, complex systems. And um, so I feel like I hardly know enough to say anything about quantum, although I have been on a, a dissertation committee of a student who was applying quantum methods to optimization and machine learning, so I know uh, that much about it. Uh, but in general, I guess I share Marcus's view that um, the sort of direction that AI needs to go is to move towards more um, decision making over larger sets of agents than what's currently focused on now. So either we focus on pattern recognition, prediction over large size problems with many instances, but make one prediction, or we focus on reinforcement learning methods that are um, helping agents make sequential decisions um, in a continuous environment, but there's like one agent or two agents. And so I think sort of marrying those two or bridging the gap between them um, and having uh, systems that have multiple agents making decisions at different time horizons, um, which requires planning and reasoning at level of complexity that we're not doing right now. I think that's really the, the future of AI. Um, and I guess my initial thoughts on quantum of how that's going to help is that um, in general, everything that we tackle that's of any interest in AI is computationally um, intractable. And so having methods from quantum that would help us um, estimate more efficiently um, to learn those models and reason inside them uh, will will help us push forward AI. So those are my initial thoughts. Great, wonderful. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, so uh, the next uh, speaker I'd like to introduce is uh, Professor Alexandra Bolteseva. Uh, Professor Bolteseva is the Ron and Dottie Garvin Tonjes, Professor of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue. Her research focuses on nanophotonics, plasmonics, optical metamaterials uh, and nanofabrication. Uh, she's the, a, a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and the Materials Research Society and has received numerous awards uh, for her research, uh, including the MIT Technology Review uh, TR35 award. Uh, so um, Sasha, if you could share your thoughts with us. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Anand. Well, first of all, I am extremely honored to be part of this panel and um, our photonics uh, team at Purdue is entering this two emerging or concurrently happening revolutions in quantum NAI from the perspective of optics at large and optical technologies. I have spent many years working on optical materials and this gives me um, yet another uh, great pleasure to be speaking today because Bell Labs is known to be the idea factory that actually fueled a range of what we called a quieter revolution in materials that actually led to absolutely disruptive technologies. So what I believe is needed um, in the field of quantum, and obviously I am not a skeptic, I am a true believer, and I consider the area of quantum um, much broader than just quantum computing because we are witnessing a rise of both just interest but also huge investment and tremendous progress in the areas of both quantum computing but also quantum communication systems that will give us the ultimate security and quantum sensors. And I would say that um, those areas of quantum, quantum communication systems and, and quantum sensors um, would be uh, the lower hanging fruit for the whole quantum um, um, technology and quantum information science and technology revolution. So what the challenges and what we have to do um, is in fact to build on what we know in the areas of devices, and I'm speaking about broadly about electronic and protonics and magnetic devices. And now how to integrate this knowledge 
uh, with existing machine learning approaches to enable the next generation of quantum practical quantum on chip devices. We have databases of optical properties. We have a tons of physical concepts that enable one or the other phenomenon that we would like to utilize. We know um, different architectures for different devices. Everything, uh, including semiconductor industry, quantum photonics and other areas, going and entering the area of heterogeneous um, integration and multiple functionalities. All this require a collaboration, as uh, Dr. Weldon just mentioned, of a human brain and a machine that will be able to process all the data that we have generated in the area of materials, device design, and approaches in inverse design together to actually push the frontiers of this field further and to enable practical devices. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Appreciate that. Um, last but not the least, we have Professor Kaushik Roy. Um, very uh, pleased to introduce uh, um, my colleague. Uh, he is the Edward G. Tiedemann Jr. Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue. Um, he um, has been at Purdue um, since 93 uh, and before that spent uh, three years at Texas Instruments. Um, he has uh, received a whole range of awards, uh, too numerous to uh, list out here, but uh, notably the SRC Technical Achieve Excellence Award from the Semiconductor Research Corporation, the SRC Inventors Award, the SRC Corporation uh, Aristotle Award, uh, the DOD Vannevar Bush Faculty Fellowship, um, the Faculty Excellence Award uh, from, the, from Purdue College of uh, Engineering, uh, the Humboldt Award, uh, IEEE Circuits and System Society's uh, Technical Excellence Award. Um, so Kaushik is also the director of the Center for Brain Inspired Computing, a large multi-university effort at Purdue focusing on cognitive computing all the way from algorithms to hardware. So Kaushik, if you could uh, give us your uh, initial thoughts. All right, hey, thanks Ananda and thanks Sumit for including me in the panel. Uh, so let me start uh, by saying that I also don't know much about quantum computing. Um, in fact, uh, I uh, took uh, and I audited, audited a course this uh, semester um, that was offered from ECE and I didn't even do the homework. So my, uh, the students in the class probably know more than I do. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get started with uh, AI, which I know a little bit more. And um, so there are several interesting problems uh, to be tackled in AI and in AI, uh, 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 and then there are several issues that needs to be considered. To start with, I feel that um, explainability and understanding AI is still a black box. So there's a need to really come up with techniques to have better explainability, better reasoning, and to be really able to say why we are doing what we are doing and, uh, uh, you know, and why we are not able to get answers in certain cases uh, and to be able to explain, uh, explain that properly. So that's one thing that's gonna be extremely important from the AI point of view. And the, some of the other areas, and that's from the algorithm and learning side of things. But if I were to really think about uh, uh, the hardware aspects of it, uh, it turns out it's gonna be energy consumption, energy consumption, energy consumption. And that's huge. And if you were to really um, uh, you know, have uh, uh, AI or machine learning integrated into the IOTs and on these edge devices, there's a need for really thinking about uh, um, you know, uh, devices, architectures, uh, and to be able to co-design so that we can get uh, you know, a huge amount of energy improvement huh? and to be able to run things with the battery. Now, um, not knowing much about uh, quantum computing, uh, you know, certainly I agree with the fact that uh, you know, AI can certainly help in coming up with uh, the right kind of materials, right kind of devices uh, to explore that space for uh, quantum computing. Uh, on the other side of it, uh, you know, if you have to really think about uh, AI algorithms, they to the quantum algorithms. So is it possible that I can potentially, you know, somehow be able to use AI algorithms uh, in the quantum domain? That's another area that one can potentially think of. Again, I don't have uh, any uh, magic bullet or answers for that, but those are possible areas where quantum uh, computing and AI can uh, potentially collaborate. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you all for your uh, very insightful uh, initial thoughts. 
Um, and so um, I guess, uh, you know, um, maybe um, I will go down the list of questions, but, um, you know, uh, since we had at least a couple of, um, if I should say quantum skeptics, maybe I will try to uh, explore that aspect a little more. And, uh, you know, at least from my reading uh, and, and what I understand of, of uh, what people are making of this, for example, this sort of area of quantum AI, uh, you know, maybe explore and ask a few questions down the road. But let's start with, um, you know, your top two, and maybe this could be a very brief answer. What are the top two challenges uh, you think uh, need to be addressed uh, in AI? And, and I know many of you have already talked about things like, you know, uh, explainability and, um, you know, opening up the black box. But if you could just, you know, in, in very briefly uh, state that in your view, what are the top two challenges for AI? And to the extent that you are comfortable, you know, for, for quantum computing as well. So, we'll start with Marcus, maybe. Uh, okay, well, I've, I've given my challenges in AI. Um, in quantum computing, uh, I think that the, the still only Shaw's algorithm and Grover's algorithm, both pioneered at Bell Labs, that are provably uh, mathematically superior on a quantum system and, and therefore can achieve you know, quantum supremacy, if you want, that, uh, that on a quantum system, they will outperform a classical system. So what the what there needs to be on the quantum side is a set of algorithms that go beyond factorization and uh, and unstructured sort uh, to that 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 can be used generally. Obviously, there are quantum mechanical calculations one can do that, of course, work well on quantum systems. But most of the interesting quantum systems actually end up being analog systems, in my view. So they're actually modeling physical phenomena through coupled oscillators and Ising model oscillators, and so. I would say, uh, and that's because the physical world is more interesting sort of space to explore uh, with efficient computing than the quantum space simply because there are no set of quantum algorithms that are probably better than a classical computer other than those two. So that's the dearth of, of, of stuff that you can do on quantum computer that you can't do on a classical computer, that, that's it. And I don't allow for quantum chemical calculations, which of course, should be superior to decompose all the states uh, there because they're inherently quantum systems. So I think it's human world problems that can be solved by a quantum system more efficiently than in a classical system. I think that's a gap. And so that would be my, my big one. Then of course, most quantum computers are massively super cooled, uh, liquid helium cooled systems that are superconducting and or have uh, you know fraction quantum ball states. So they're they're big monoliths uh, of computing resource. Uh, I wonder in the new edge cloud paradigm with low latency systems, whether quantum systems will always be running in the back end somewhere, but they won't actually ever be able to scale to the edge uh, given the nature of the materials involved in the cooling systems, et cetera. Therefore, they're a background back end system. They're not a foreground um, real time processing system, which again, put, sort of marginalizes them. So, uh, by the way, I do agree with the design of new materials, but I put that in the quantum chemical uh, slash uh, quantum system uh, design. So that's uh, what I would say. Okay, maybe I can continue and I would like to definitely build on that. Um, and um, um, I'm, I'm not an expert in quantum algorithm either. Um, but what I would like to point out um, is that um, indeed these are very complex system and we need to develop um, really uh, robust platforms to actually demonstrate um, scalable quantum computing. What's important to realize though in the whole area of quantum is that there will not be a single platform for quantum technologies. And I think that this is something that is like not clear and people are sitting and waiting and, 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 um, and waiting to hear, okay, so the winner is, um, you know, superconducting qubit or the winner is this for um, enabling the quantum technology. Uh, whereas in reality, um, and that's what we see already in emerging markets of like quantum sensors and other quantum based devices that um, we will have to branch out into different platforms. And for example, talking about quantum computing, um, uh, quantum photonic uh, computing um, might not be uh, the way um, 
like a, um, let's say straightforward way to universal quantum computing, but it might be enabling uh, technology for solving a set of problems and also for demonstrating supremacy to start with. So I do believe that we will have to pursue different directions. And, and have this uh, um, uh, different platforms investigated in order to enable different applications. On another point, um, which is different um, from the you know, quantum aspect, I would like to uh, go back to classical machine learning algorithms. And I think that what we have been missing in the whole area, um, if, if you wish, of, of engineering and, and technologies is just to um, integrate uh, machine learning approaches with um, our um, development and optimization of devices. Uh, physics informed uh, machine learning algorithms is something that uh, we are missing, well, at least in the fields that our groups are working in. And, and that's where we have to go. How do we couple our um, knowledge about physics and phenomena involved in a specific system, whether it's a dark matter detector or a single photon source, and um, uh, train or develop a machine learning algorithms that will help us to design uh, the system to speed up the readings and to achieve greater performance and greater sensitivity, for example, in case of sensors. Uh, Jen or uh, Kaushik, do you wanna add on to your initial comments in regards to the top two challenges? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when I, when I initially talked about the fact that explainability is really one of the biggest problems and uh, opening the black box, uh, of AI, um, you know, I can add to that. There are other issues that one has to really think about. I mean, for better learning, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, there's a need to focus on from the from AI point of view: uh, can we learn with less data? Uh, can we have better generalization? Um, can we have, uh, for example, um, uh, you know, um, better? I mean, it is also related to explainability in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, adversarial. Um, uh, inputs that some of these systems, the AI systems get uh, fooled very easily. Uh, we don't know if the brain gets fooled or not, but certainly some of these systems do get fooled. The you know, brains do get fooled in different ways. Uh, but can we also learn from, uh, you know, uh, neuroscience? And uh, if we take some cues from neuroscience and uh, try to really build uh, systems, um, uh, taking Again, biological inspirations, and there's a good possibility that we can actually implement not only better learning algorithms, but possibly, uh, in fact, even better hardware. Uh, uh, and on the other side of it, uh, if I were to really go into uh, thinking about the hardware and the devices, uh, you know, traditionally, we have been all, always using the standard CMOS uh, circuits. And the CMOS transistors certainly are excellent on-off switches, uh, though somebody might complain that with scale, scaling of technology, they may not be that good uh, uh, switch anymore. But anyway, they're certainly good switches, but they may not be really a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, they may not be able to mimic a neuron or a synaptic dynamics really well. Huh? So to that effect, there's certainly a need for really thinking about uh, new materials, uh, new devices that can potentially uh, mimic the neuron, neuronal and the synaptic dynamics in a more efficient way to be able to build, you know, a hardware that can um, implement some of these uh, algorithms or brain inspired algorithms uh, more effectively and efficiently. So that's uh, certainly coming uh, more from the AI uh, side of things, algorithms and the hardware. Um, and I guess uh, we'll be talking more about uh, the quantum part of it uh, uh, later on. Yeah, so I guess I, I don't feel comfortable identifying challenges in quantum, but I, I can say that in the AI space for sort of several of the issues that were already mentioned, like the physics-based learning or the explainability um, or the sort of neurosymbolic stuff that I was alluding to, um, those, the, the sort of 
difficulty of those problems is that really we're trying to learn and optimize our models over very, very large search spaces. And even finding explanations means searching over the space and to see how why did you narrow it down to the decision that you made. And so I think uh, a key challenge in AI and uh, more generally just in optimization is, is how to um, become more effective at doing combinatorial optimization over those large spaces. And that could be a single model where it's parameterized in a combinatorial fashion or over a space of possible models where you're searching over the model structure and then it becomes combinatorial at the model structure level. Um, and that's really the thing that's hampering progress in AI right now because all the uh, successes that we have with deep learning and neural networks are really with differentiable functions um, that make the optimization that much easier to, to do. Not that it's easy, but <laughs> it's easier than the combinatorial optimization. And so if um, quantum computing was able to help us do that combinatorial optimization much more effectively, then I think there would be sort of, we would make progress in leaps and bounds in the AI space. And a lot of the things that are difficult right now uh, to have full scale, you know, sort of human level AI and um, reasoning and planning um, would start to become much easier. So I think that's really where we need to, to move towards. And on, in sort of on the flip side, I guess I've heard some things um, about how even to understand what the quantum sensors or systems are doing, we might collect large amounts of data to then try to figure out what's going on and a similar types of um, sort of learning needs to happen in large um, search spaces if you're trying to prove the sa safety of certain AI systems. Um, and so interestingly, we can potentially use machine learning algorithms to look for patterns over those large spaces to try to figure out how to search over the, them more effectively. So even though we need quantum to do search, maybe machine learning can help learn how to do that search more effectively, um, both for quantum and then to, to funnel it back to the AI methods. So I'll, I'll build on what Jennifer just said. Uh, a space where I'm not a quantum skeptic is where uh, if you need to train a quantum system, uh, then I, I absolutely agree that if there were an AI system surrounding a quantum system where quantum system computes something from some inputs, and, and decomposes the states or collapses the states to an answer. Someone has to judge the goodness of that answer. It, is, it may be quantum correct, but is it correct or is it the desired answer for the problem in, in, in question, right? So unless it's a closed form problem where you know the answer space, where in each case you just acknowledge the quantum system behaved as, as expected. But if it's a large space, there's a lot of expectation values, you can imagine having a AI system supervise the learning of a quantum system to discern which of the outputs are the desirable outputs. Think molecular design, for example. If there were structures computed by a quantum system that were possible drug designs, right? Un previously unknown. And the way we do that today is either make it or have an AI system just guess, right? And it guesses based on its trained models. But if we had a quantum system, a quantum system could calculate molecular designs that would be optimal for drugs or whatever. Um, and an AI system monitors that with some set of rules that say, yeah, that, that has good, let's say, marketability or manufacturability, which a quantum system will never know about, right? Uh, you could imagine an AI surround on a quantum system would actually be a very interesting couplet. Um, no, that's that's fascinating. I, I you know, I think um, I'd like to uh, focus a little more on on, on what uh, uh, both Jen and, and uh, Marcus uh, just said, which is, um, if you know, looking to the next stage of AI, right? Uh, you know, going beyond perception to you know reasoning, decision making. Um, you know, whether you call it causal AI, neurosymbolic AI, uh, broad AI, and so on. Um, I, I guess one of the challenges is it's not from a computational perspective. Uh, it's not just more linear algebra and more matrix uh, math necessarily that's going to be needed. Uh, you know, today's hardware like you know the GPUs or the TPUs and uh, and so on are, are really good at that stuff. And you know, again, I, 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 personally, I, I don't think a quantum computing um, system is ever going to be competitive at just you know matrix multiplication. That's not the right problem. Uh, but uh, if in the AI if uh, you know path, 
uh, if there is a need to search over large combinatorial spaces, right, um, and uh, you know integrate um, sort of those search engines, you know, with with the more traditional statistical AI systems, um, is quantum computing the way there? Because certainly, even from the neural perspective, the demand for compute is growing way faster than traditional hardware can keep up, right? I mean, OpenAI estimates it's uh, doubling every three and a half months. That is, you know, way way super. Moore's law or any, anything that you know, current hardware uh, roadmaps can, can even think of providing. So do you think that's an angle where maybe um, perhaps in a limited sense, but quantum computing can, can contribute? Yeah, but I, then I get back to my algorithm problem, Anand. Uh, I, need, if I need to operate on algorithms that are provably better on a quantum system. Otherwise, and the quantum system is not gonna be lower power if I think about, if I include the cooling system. <laughs> Right, uh, a quantum system is a is a energy hog. The actual qubit structure, etc., may may actually be relatively low energy, but the surrounder is massively power consuming. So uh, I think it has to be the set of algorithms or called problem spaces, which which has to, which may be molecular or quantum system design, and the two known good quantum algorithms. Then absolutely, you're right. If that can be generalized to a lot of problems, then quantum is huge, and the AI surround helping that quantum system learn or achieve uh, a human valuable outcome. Because as I said, if I think about quantum systems don't really understand anything about what we might consider economically viable. So if I'm trying to answer a problem, quantum system will simply collapse to whatever is the quantum minimum, right? Given, but, but it may not be economically viable that answer. So I think there's some sort of the AI system in some ways could encapsulate all knowledge we have. And the quantum system could be used for the part of the problem that was inherently quantum good. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. uh, so from your perspective of, you know, sort of the investments going into quantum computing, right? The, the Googles of the world, the Microsofts, the IBMs, uh, is that you, you think the premise or is, is it different? Because um, clearly, you know, uh, it's not clear that just factorization can drive that kind of investment. Most of those, I think, Anand, are actually annealing systems and quantum and, and they sort of quantum annealing systems or analog annealing systems that actually set something up in, in a state and then anneal it to an answer. But they, they're trying to compute things that uh, are actually more coupled states. But they represent what I would call macroscopic physical phenomena because they're describable by, say, icing mathematics or icing model. So those systems all are good at solving icing problems, but they're not truly quantum problems, right? They may set up the states in a way that looks semi-quantum and they're entangled. But in the end, I think most of the problems they're solving, I would all uh, argue are uh, icing type problems, which you know, are not fully quantum, they're just coupled. So I think we need to distinguish between coupled systems and truly quantum systems. And uh, I honestly, I, I sponsored one in Bell Labs and we couldn't ever figure out what we would do with it. It just seems super cool. Uh, and so that's not a good justification for research. We actually had one that was based on a, a, a Majorana fermium, a boson uh, interaction uh, based on a fraction of quantum Hall effect. It was a phenomenally interesting thing, but uh, in the end, it wasn't clear what it would be good for, uh, honestly. So we were going for the sake of going because the physics was super interesting, uh, but uh, I'm still yet to see something that says, and I think NIST has a list of quantum good problems but whenever I looked at that list, I was never inspired. Understood. So it's more it really in the algorithms for a broader class of problems, you know, in the quantum space. That's the that's the bottleneck. Um, okay. So maybe uh, we can take one or two from the audience because I, I I'm starting to see a few questions flowing in, uh, and this can be any of the panelists. Feel free to uh, uh, address. Um, what do you believe is the future of a silicon qubit based hardware implementation of a quantum computer? You know. Uh, furthermore, do you believe that there would not be a singular physical implementation serving as the zeitgeist, such as today's computers? Yeah, I think Jen answered it very well. Oh, actually, yeah, sorry, uh, uh, Alessandra. Uh, there won't be, because all the technologies are good for something in quantum space. Um, and the extent of the qubit range you can get versus the stability versus the error correction. So quantum systems essentially have all these error correcting qubits uh, and different physical materials have different requirements of that because they have stability that's different, right? And so uh, therefore the gate structures you can build with each one or the extent of the quantum system 
is different for each one. So I think there will be a set, not one. It, it won't be a von Neumann machine, x86 or ARM architecture processor. There'll be a set and there'll be a pool of resources that are available centralized that you can submit your tasks to and get an answer back. I think, I think that's how I see it being. And it'll be a whole host of different material systems. So it won't be on your desktop. It won't be in the edge cloud. It'll be a pool somewhere for the set of problems it's good at solving. Yes, I also, I just uh, want to add a couple of things from the uh, technology uh, driven platforms. Uh, like many people believe that it really won't be um, practical if we won't base it on um, existing like semiconductor production lines. And one of the approaches, um, for example, in quantum photonic computing is actually to utilize the infrastructure which is already available. But the truth is that we would need um, to have this uh, smaller uh, fabs that would be working with all those other exotic materials and um, architectures that are hard to realize, but that would be specifically tailored for maybe addressing um, a specific need of a problem, um, depending, yeah, of what people have in mind. Sounds good, thank you. There's a couple of questions that are, I would say more related to um, the talk, um, Marcus's talk from before. And I will, since you know we have you here, maybe post them towards the end. So just, this is for the people asking the questions. I'll focus initially on the questions related to the panel and then, and then we'll maybe, um, you know, ask a couple of the more general questions and anybody can feel free to respond. Um, the next one um, I'd like to pose is, should the problems, um, I'm assuming that this is for, you know, quantum computing be formulated in terms of solutions to stochastic differential equations? Would that help in some sense? And, and perhaps it's related more to the quantum annealing, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it to the panelists to see what you think. Can we make more progress towards, you know, bringing more applications to quantum computers by thinking of more problems as solutions to stochastic differential equations? Probably, uh, not being true expert, I would say yeah, probably that's, that's an interesting space again, to, to frame problems that way and have them sort of coupled solutions. What you're looking for is a space where they're coupled solutions, right? That you can then simultaneously uh, create all the states, all the solutions, and then based on the applied input, achieve from many solutions, the, the one outcome from a complex problem space. Okay, a anybody else has, has a take on that? Uh, there's one other question, um, quantum computing aside, what would be the role of quantum communications in the future? Do you envision a quantum network with fundamentally secure communications? that may be integrated with classical networks, for example, to increase the security of the network? Yeah, quantum key distribution is already used over optical networks and Sasha can answer that. But yeah, they're already deployed uh, so that you can determine whether or not the information transferred over that one is it's, it's a the key is distributed that the key then can be used in a classical way, right? But you wanna make sure the key distribution is, is, uh, was, not, um, was not intercepted. Uh, and, and indeed, there's some sense that you could then look at the information transfer and look for perturbation of the information transfer as well uh, in a photonic uh, communication network. I think uh, that maybe for the most ultra secure networks, but there are other security approaches, of course, that uh, I think it's nice to have quantum key distribution, but equally, there are pretty effective methods for distributing keys that work well today. Of course, a quantum computer could break some of those uh, RSA methods. Uh, so there's a bit of a chicken and egg there that uh, maybe we need better key distribution if we have a quantum computer that can actually crack the cipher codes of, of, of current cipher models or security models. But uh, Sasha, what do you think? Well, I definitely think that it's uh, coming up and we already seen uh, the first uh, demonstration uh, using the satellites in China and actually this country was falling a little bit behind on both investment and, and, and uh, investigation of um, quantum uh, communication systems. Uh, now, uh, Department of Energy has made uh, really tremendous investment in the area, both quantum um, computing and quantum 
communication system. So we have uh, Chicago Exchange Link, and um, I mean that's that's it's just a question of time when these uh, systems would be uh, would become uh, practical. And uh, here again, we are looking into um, uh, systems that would be uh, um, integrated with existing platforms. So with onto photonic circuitry, for example, with optical fibers. Um, and um, yeah, and that's where we are going. Um, okay, so I, I'd, I'd say um, there's this is more of a comment, but I'll put it to the panel in case anybody wants to react. Uh, it's interesting that Intel, the specialist in silicon, is building their architecture, I'm assuming this is quantum computing architecture on superconducting bits, not semiconductor quantum dots. So does that mean silicon is, I guess the implication there is silicon maybe doesn't really, is, is not the way to go for quantum. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Sasha. Do you have any thoughts or, or Marcus, anybody? Yeah, I mean, the, the Bell Labs one was based on three, five materials, uh, indium, gallium, arsenide, uh, quantum, two-dimensional quantum uh, structures that, uh, and that, that's typically the case. There's a nano material approaches, those graphene based approaches. I think silicon is the platform, but probably non-silicon based uh, devices is, is certainly the case, but so that's where the photonics and the quantum come together because they tend to use the same similar materials. So that's that's true. Um, I think all the quantum phenomena I've seen generally are wells or layer structures that are confinement structures that achieve some sort of quantum state that is not uh, based on silicon alone. It may have some silicon elements to it, but it uses tries to use CMOS processing to produce those, but in the end, it's it's a lot of you know vapor deposition and multi-layer structures, and then CMOS circuitry around it to, to program it. Yeah, again, it's just the uh, the question of um, what um, problems and what are our aims for different platforms. And if we are talking about silicon and um, conventional semiconductor industry, uh, we have to mention one more time that the, the future of the whole industry is uh, heterogeneous uh, integration. So um, whether uh, we are talking quantum or not, um, essentially every uh, device is heading towards ultimately integrating uh, dissimilar systems, interfaces, um, 2D materials uh, together with uh, established silicon and um, many more. Um, speaking uh, specifically about um, one of the most promising platforms for uh, quantum uh, photonic systems and on-tube circuitry, um, silicon nitride, for example, is uh, one of the um, promising um, uh, candidates. Um, and again, this is something where you can build on what's available um, and um, explore uh, both the CMOS uh, compatible materials like uh, silicon based, um, but also 3.5. There is a lot of research on integrating um, these two platforms together as well. And in future, we will be integrating these different materials and architectures together because we are heading towards multifunctionality and more complex devices. Uh, I have a question that seems right up uh, Jen's alley. Uh, Oracle-based algorithms like Grover's search algorithm seem fundamentally similar to the K-armed bandit problem. Um, since uh, Grover's algorithm has been proven to be superior over you know, classical search algorithms, how feasible would it be to extend this um, similarity or superiority to multi-armed bandits. So I guess the implication is, you know, is, is there a connection there that would that you know would would make um, um, it 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 helpful at least in the RL context for quantum computing to help? Yeah. So I am not familiar with that result, but I saw the question and then just searched for it. Well, <laughs> the last question was being answered. There's already two papers on people uh, trying to solve multi-arm bandit optimization using this kind of idea. So I guess the answer would be yes. Um, so this uh, seems to be exactly the kind of 
thing that um, you know I'm not familiar with because I'm I'm not working in the quantum machine learning area. But um, any of the advances in the algorithms, um, the computation algorithms that are made, if there can be shown to be a relation to the types of optimization problems that are needed in um, reinforcement learning or other areas that we're trying to push forward, then absolutely this is the kind of um, success that we would be able to build on. Um, but I, I don't, so if you, if you literally just search for um, quantum multi-arm bandits, you'll find the two papers that, uh, that I just found. Um, so I think that would be a, a great thing to look into. Um, and uh, I will definitely look into it more after. Yeah, and, and these are the, this is the algorithmic expansion I talked about. The trick mm -hmm. is nearly every time, the reason why there are only two provably good quantum algorithms uh, is every time one of these is proposed, you can decompose it into a classical equivalent that, uh, that performs as well or better. Uh, so that's always the trick. It's not that a quantum system can't do it. It's can it do it better than a classical system? And that's that's the hard part. So I know a little bit about uh, K-means testing and K-based problems, but uh, I, you'd have to see if you could actually decompose it into something that was classically more efficient to compute than a quantum system. And that's always the test. And that's where most of them fail because everyone says, oh, look, I, I got excited. I, I did it on quantum computer, but then you say, yeah, but you know, you could have actually done it in a classical system uh, with greater efficiency by any computing metric, right, of number of computational cycles. And so I love the fact the algorithmic space is, is expanding, but my only hesitation is it's been expanding and contracting for years in quantum computing. Yeah, and your, your observation is exactly the experience I had when I was on this dissertation committee where they were trying to do optimization with uh, the D-Wave chip. Mm -hmm. And um, and specifically, they were showing they could do it, but um, in the end, they weren't actually faster than just directly optimizing um, with our standard methods. Exactly, so, Jen, yeah. exactly. Well, I'd love to be, so I'm a skeptic, but uh, an optimist, maybe. I'd love to see that. Yeah, that algorithmic space expand. I'm all for new computing technologies of every type. A related question. Um, uh, I, I think um, you know, and and this maybe to a certain extent, you know, is is you know sort of a terminology or scope issue, right? Are are we uh, are we too hung up on quantum supremacy? Uh, you know, if there's a benef practical benefit to these quantum annealing type systems, uh, I mean, I understand the terminology discussion aside. You know, should we hold our feet or the, the, the quantum community's feet to the fire <laughs> on quantum supremacy? Or if there is a, a, you know, should the focus really be on these, you know, pseudo quantum, if you want to call them pseudo quantum systems? Yes, short answer. Yeah, but I suspect it's the quantum uh, community that's actually holding, that, that's actually promoting quantum supremacy because it's headline grabbing. If, if you wrote the headline, we'll, we'll be useful in some part of parameter space that doesn't get uh, the same headlines as we've achieved quantum supremacy. Sure. Um, okay, sounds good. Uh, a couple of uh, other comments, uh, questions. Uh, how about, there was a great discussion on exploring new quantum technologies driven by AI, I guess, you know, Sasha and Kaushik briefly mentioned it. How about new adaptive AI algorithms driven by the physics of quantum uh, technologies? Or let's maybe expand that to you know quantum annealing type technologies. Can we should we re, try to rethink the AI algorithms to really take advantage of those hardware substrates? Or is it is it stochastic gradient descent or you know whatever else uh, in the in the RL space? Yeah, I guess I think in the AI space we are happy to try to re redesign things that are going in, in multiple ways that are going to help us learn better. And so if um, the way of thinking about how the quantum systems are working can transform how we frame problems in terms of search or optimization, uh, I think that definitely will happen. Um, I guess the way I have looked at things as to be more inspired by biology and how our biological systems 
learn. Um, but I think similar things could come from uh, other types of uh, other types of systems. So basically, I feel like in the space of machine learning and AI, we're really just trying to abstract out uh, these sort of problem formulations of how to do this search and learning and um, pattern recognition given sort of observed data, uh, data inputs and our ability to interact with the environment. And so if there are new substrates that would allow us to do that more effectively, um, I think that would definitely be interesting to explore. Okay. Great. Um, one more uh, from the audience. Is it possible that AI may actually hit a wall beyond the current success of ML models? Or do you see a path forward in harder learning slash optimization type problems? I think we've sort of covered it a little bit, but maybe um, if uh, you could address, I'll maybe start with Kaushik and anybody else. Um, you know, anything is possible. But then again, you know, I mean, I see the possibilities of moving forward with uh, new algorithms uh, is enormous. I mean, I think the reason why sort of AI made such a huge progress starting in, you know, 2010 or 2012 is because uh, the hardware was available. And more recently, what you also see is that some of these, uh, you know, progress that has been made in natural language processing and so on, and that requires a good amount of computing, right? And so I believe that uh, once we have better hardware and uh, we're able to explore these new algorithms more effectively, I, I see you know, interesting things happening. I guess uh, I can follow up on that. I think that I totally agree with what Kashik was saying that the success currently of AI is due to the availability of the hardware and the data and the number of people that are working on solving these problems all together that makes for a massive effort to sort of push forward this success in AI. Um, AI typically has overpromised what we're able to do. And so I like as the cynic in me, I say we're absolutely going to hit a wall where, <laughs> where we're going to have come up against harder problems that people expected to be solved more quickly. But at the same time, I think the amount of interest and effort that's being put forward from these all these different dimensions means that we won't hit quite the same wall that we did back in the 80s when we had the first AI winter um, where people sort of gave up and said it's, it's way too hard. Um, so I think um, we have, we're on a good um, trajectory. And I think as long as we keep identifying the sort of local successes, um, it, things will keep moving forward. So I'll go with, to, uh, go ahead, Kathy. No, I, I was just to add to what uh, Jennifer said. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting developments are also happening in the neuroscience domain. So again, I believe that uh, there are new learning possibilities, uh, you know, taking cues from what we learned from neuroscience. And that is also possibly going to push us forward into building interesting and more, uh, you know, um, uh, complex dynamical systems. And so I'll build on what you said, Kaushik, built on what Jen said. Um, I think um, analog coupled neuromorphic things might be better chips for new AI than quantum chips, because there's a basis in, and again, the problems we want to solve are sort of human problems, not quantum problems. We exist in a neurological analog -y world it makes sense that if we had a computing device mm -hmm. that was a highly coupled neuromorphic analogy thing, it would solve those problems uh, as efficiently as we do for physical world problems, but it would explore the space much more richly than we do because we live a linear existence, right? And, and then we compare notes with other humans and say, oh, that must be the answer. But of course, you'd like to do a much larger search and analysis like AI systems can do so call it analog search space or neurological search space, I think would be really interesting and probably more interesting than quantum uh, overall in terms of human impact. Cool. Um, a colleague of mine, actually, uh, this is more of a comment, uh, uh, says, and I'm not sure if this is specifically directed to Jen, and I think that this could trigger a whole different panel. So I'm just going to, you know, so we end on maybe a bit of a provocative note with a preview for maybe a future panel, I'll say, you know, uh, and, uh, this is uh, in the chat, uh, you know, uh, from Professor Vijay Kumar. Wait a minute, do you agree with the hardware guy that ML success is due to hardware? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the algorithms are 
20 years old, right? Uh, their CNNs come from Jan LeCun and co in the 90s doing, you know, image recognition or figure recognition. The change was the hardware. And then novel versions of CNNs, right? GANs, mm -hmm. et cetera. Not just the hardware, the availability of data, That's right? right? So the Converge. hardware, the hardware helps us be able to harness that data. And then um, I also should give a shout out to the thousands of grad students that <laughs> do the tuning of these algorithms, um, either on internships or <laughs> while they're working on their PhDs, because that's also a huge component of this as well. Maybe if I may, I would like to jump in. Uh, Jennifer, you just mentioned uh, graduate students. And I would like to bring up another challenge, which is for both quantum and AI, and that's training the future workforce. Now, I'm putting the head of a workforce lead for the Quantum Science Center, and that's where uh, we are lacking. So this panel is organized by ECE, and we are responsible for training the next generation of scientists and engineers that will be pushing these two fields further, and they have to understand both of them. That's that's a great uh, that's a great point. I mean, uh, you know, uh, we we have just uh, you know uh, getting to the end of our time. But if anybody wants to share their thoughts on that angle, on on you know education and workforce development, uh, either in AI or quantum, you know, any any thoughts, um, we can close on that note. I guess I would say that that also uh, points to the complexity of what we need from the students right now, because we talked about, you know, having this stack that goes all the way from, you know, chips to the algorithms, to the data and the mathematics that lie on top of that and the, and the higher level reasoning that we need to put into all the system to have it, you know, do the kind of AI things that we want. Um, really, we're expecting students to be sort of familiar with things all across that stack, which is um, asking quite a lot of people and maybe looking forward, students could think of sort of where they sit in that stack and, and think about expanding their view to, you know, maybe one layer above or one layer below wherever they're sitting, that would be really useful to them um, sort of moving forward in their works. Work. Which is a pitch for the multidisciplinary nature of Purdue and the collaborative nature. So I think it's a good thing. I'll, I'll end only uh, an end of my favorite quantum quote. When you think you understand it, it you only reveal that you don't. So uh, that, that makes, <laughs> that makes it very hard to, uh, for students, but I'm highly sympathetic. And AI is somewhat similar in a mysterious way, although it's mathematically understandable, uh, its reasoning is, is hard to fathom. So it's two areas where the understanding is mystical slash mythical, and they've come together to make a, a real odyssey for students. But if you can operate in that space, as Jen said, uh, it's, you'll have a great career ahead of you. Wonderful. Okay, so we will close on that positive note. And you know, I'd like to thank um, all the panelists for sharing their insights, their time, uh, and in particular, Dr. Weldon for agreeing to do this at the end of, of a fairly long day. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I believe this is being recorded and will be made available for those who, and I, I saw a number of people joined you know, um, at various points through, during the panel. So if you're, you know, you're interested in catching the parts that you missed, um, uh, the recording should be, should be available. Um, and uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Professor Sumit Gupta, who was um, the organizer of this panel. Uh, so with that, again, I'll uh, you know thank everybody uh, involved, and uh, you know um, call call it I guess call it call an end to the panel. Thank you all. Uh, and my last pitch, and and is the questions we didn't get to on my talk. Send me a note on LinkedIn, and I'll uh, answer them for you. Thank thank you very much, and I do apologize mm. to the. Uh, whose questions I couldn't, uh, I think I asked, asked most of the questions, if not all that are relevant to the panel. There were a few good questions, maybe more specific to the talk. Um, perfect. So that's uh, for anybody who asked a question that I, I ended up not asking. Please post them directly to Dr. Weldon on his LinkedIn. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.